for coming tonight. Um, and thanks for coming with the last minute change. We thought that the weather was going to be nice. As I canceled, it was pouring outside and I had visions that the sun was going to be out this evening, but you never know. So thank you very much. Um, we have two students reading this evening. I am so excited to have student poets read. I think it adds a whole different perspective to the series. So thank you very much, Winona and Nadia, for coming this evening. Uh, Winona, I'm going to start with you first. Winona is a 2016 graduate from Rockville High School and will be attending Wagner College in the fall. She's been writing for the past three years. Thank you, John. Um, as part of her school's creative writing program. Winona says, writing has provided me with an outlet as well as a new way of learning and experiencing. And I think most of us writers and poets can feel the, feel the same way about that. It is a passion I know I will continue and I will grow with it throughout the journey of my life. Winona, why don't you go ahead and start? Winona, you gotta get really close to that. Really close, okay. Yeah. I'm taller than most people. Um, hello, I'm Winona Chef, and I'm from Vernon, Connecticut, and I go to Rockville High School. Well, actually, I just graduated from Rockville High School a few days ago, so that's exciting. Thank you. Um, I'll be reading three poems for you guys today. My first one uh, is called A Boarding Willow. She waits for someone to recognize she's not there, wondering if anyone has noticed. Her house overflows with unwanted pasts and hopeful futures. Her mother's never home and her father doesn't care, so she creates magic with her hands, lets dreams sit at the tips of her fingers. Tinfoil mandalas dangle from the willow outside her childhood home as chestnut layers spread through the dead grass blades. In rain, she listens and picks at flower petals with broken nails. Anxiety dresses her frail body, covering her confidence. Underneath the willow rests hope and disparity, hugging curves she never wished for. She just wants to be happy. Regret lingers at the corner of her eyes, hatred washing her cheeks clear. Two months ago, she slipped on pills and needles, planting a willow with the wrong boy, his thoughts not worth her ink. Ice paints her throat, rushing sleet from weakened lips. Smoke clearing her head it drowns her worries in a river of thirst. She spent days teetering between today and eternity. Hours spent watching the rhythm of the sky, caring for ones who didn't even know she was there. A life she created struggles to grow, so she lies under the willow, hoping to only kill what's inside her. My next poem is about uh, my grandmother who had had lost family in the Holocaust. Concentration creation. She's a product of Brooklyn dance teacher meets a Bronx stitcher, of needles and yarn on a creaking rocking chair, a product of broken English and stale coffee, hide and seek and the quiet game. Her father paints suns and skies on her walk to school. He dusts ash off his shoulders and only inhales the breath of trees. Her mother wears broken faith on frail collarbones, her chapped lips stained with the color of lost family. Her cheeks turn rosy by cold fireplaces. This girl was born into music, swinging on a star to the beats of pride and shame, anger and strength. She dances to the rhythm of shooting lines, forming beauty out of misery, out of insanity, out of hopelessness. Her hands will never touch ink, for her skin is already marked. She is a creation of Holocaust survivor and Holocaust victim. Uh, 
Uh, my last poem is about a little boy that I babysit who's very adorable um, and is uh, not understood by his parents, and I see what he goes through. So this one's called Hunter. I've had a fever since I was in my mommy's stomach, he says, his blue eyes gazing endearingly up at me. He yanks on my shirt with his smooth baby hands and tells me he has been sick for a long time. Reaching underneath his arms, I swing him around, hoping that a dizzy haze will make his insides feel better. A green lawn and endless boy toys sit in front of him. He asks me to play beautiful music. He says, it makes me feel pretty. Closing his eyes, he stretches towards the sky, becoming light on his feet. I watch him float through the yard, twirling to the sound of chimes. He hears fingers gently pulling on a harp's strings, voices mimicking nature. He tells me there are no words, but that he understands. His body moves as if time was endless, morphing into someone his dad disapproves of. At the top of the cloak, coat closet lies a paisley cover-up. His mom wears it at the beach on days she doesn't feel confident, yet he points to it standing on his tippy toes and asks me if it's dress up time. Gracefully pulling the silk dress over his head, it hangs on his shoulders, showing scrapes across his collarbones. He says he likes to play tag. Holding his head high, his skin shines a confidence in the night sky. I'm allowed to dress up when it's dark out. No one can see me. No one can get mad. I realize he is too young to have limitations placed on his happiness. I realize beautiful music will one day be his war song. Beautiful dresses will one day be his armor. The doctor says I'm allowed to not be like the other boys, that I can get a teacup set for my birthday, and that daddy can't get mad at me when my fever goes away, when I pretend that I'm a girl. He says he has been sick for a long time. He is six years old, and I realize he understands me when I say, she won't be sick forever. That was really, that was really amazing. Thank you so much, Monona. That was really powerful. I, I nannied a lot when I was younger. One of the boys I nannied for liked to wear his mother's lipstick. And I remember the first time I saw him, I thought, wow, oh, that's, you know, I didn't want to make a, an issue of it because if he wants, I love wearing lipstick, I understand, but I could, I could feel some of that in your poem. Okay, now we're ready for Nadia. Nadia Jalel is a junior at the Act Performing Arts Magnet High School. She's been recognized and in the Scholastic Art and Writing Competition for her writing. In her free time, she enjoys reading, going for long walks, and spending time with her cat. I love spending time with my cat. <laughs> okay. So, hi, I'm Nadia, and I'm going to be reading a poem. Well, my first poem is called Prince of the Forest. When I was eight years old, a herd of deer walked across my backyard. Their little feet crunched on the half-frozen grass, little polished hooves matching glassy sky, reflecting gray eyes and dry brown grass. They did not notice me in my neon yellow jacket to, uh, to keep the hunters from mistaking me as one of the herd. There was a fawn, fragile skin and bone clinging to his mother's side, a sore thumb of pale spots and stripes sticking out of the solid brown pack. He noticed me, not stopping, the pack of rapidly moving spindly legs, but watched me. His eyes did not reflect the sky so much as they were the sky, clouded slate marbling inside and staring at me with innocent curiosity and the fear of his natural instinct. For a moment, they all disappeared into the trees before a small squeaking one, the one who'd watched me, stumbled out of the tree line. He seemed to trust his legs, but they did not seem to trust him. He stumbled forward to me. His ears were small felt flower petals, flicking bugs away as he looked me over. 
His knobby knees dwarfed the rest of him. His legs lifted entirely too high as he picked over the grass a good foot taller than he was, until we were nose to nose. He smelled like the trees, peat moss, and morning dew and river water. He did not blink or move besides his ears, flicking back and forth as he stared at me. His little thunderstorm eyes flicked over my nose, my cheeks, my ears, frozen in their position, my jacket now thinly coated in morning mist. He doesn't seem to be looking at me, but into me. I try to do the same. His round, glassy globes hold what seem to be the secrets of the earth. He has seen how harsh and how beautiful this world can be, and yet he is eons younger than I could ever be. I wonder what he sees in my eyes. A snap of a twig and he is gone. In the blink of an eye, I am watching a small white tail flick off through the grass and into the woods. It was as if he never existed. I saw a deer crossing the road today. He had antlers branching to the sky like tree limbs. He walked slowly, elegantly, thin, strong legs tapping against the concrete. When he finished crossing, he watched me drive by with thundercloud eyes before vanishing into the green. Yeah. My second poem is an Ovid, which is a form of poem that compares um, being in love with someone to a sunrise. Navy blue skies turn to deep purple. He still sleeps, dreams of us and our love, and of night never ending dancing in his mind, while I think about what will happen when morning comes. He says we are like stars, only allowed to shine when no one sees, but I am the moon and he is the sun, and we are always chasing each other over the horizon. Many embrace the light of day, relish it, but it only signals when I have to run, to leave him. There is no sun, no morning without him. His smile is the hint of light mere seconds before the dawn. His laugh is the singing of morning doves and larks. His embrace is those few seconds when maybe you think that you don't have to get up to face today. The room is still cold and the light hasn't touched his face yet and I think I can linger for a second more just to remember the suns in his eyes warming my icy cold night. The steady rhythm of his heart setting mine back from its lightning crack speed the rough, warm cage of his fingers against mine. But time has no pity on young lovers' hearts, does not care to slow for a second, to give people like us the moments we wished we had, the moments we will never have. And my last poem is titled 9-11. I am home sitting on the floor playing make-believe with my yarn-haired dolls. Mama bounces Adam, not even six months old, on her hip as she folds laundry. The room smells like fabric softener and Elizabeth Arden mixed with Michael Jackson's voice. I don't know the words, but when I think I do, I sing them out so loud I can hear my voice echo through the house. Adam's smile mirrors mine, huge brown eyes, like Daddy, fixed on my little hands and face. Mama gets up and begins to dance, and I try to dance with her. Her hair shines gold, her smile is like the sun. As she takes my hands, we spin and stamp and laugh. Daddy would dance like this with us, singing in Arabic, trying to get me to sing along. The words were different and strange in my English-speaking mouth, but somehow felt right at home. Static from the half-busted TV, the one I watched Sesame Street on an hour ago, breaks our paradise. Words I do not know come quick out of the speakers. Mama stops dancing. Adam starts to whine and she sways, not listening to the music or the TV. Her eyes wide. She leaves the room, hurries up the stairs to put Adam down for his nap. Daddy should be home soon. I'm always asleep when he comes crunching up the driveway. She should come get me, put me to sleep, but she comes back and cradles me in her arms, smoothing my dark hair. I play with her cross, the one her grandmother gave her, shimmering and reflecting against her freckled skin. I do not understand why she holds me tighter than she ever has before, or why I can see the gray at the roots of her hair beginning to streak her sunshine gold, or why when daddy comes home, the walls shake from his footsteps and his voice chokes with tears, 
or why he and Mama locked the doors so tight that not a sound could escape the house. Not the drone of the TV, not Adam's baby babble, not my attempts at speaking, not the glass shattering silence settling into my heart. Thank you. Whenever I hear anything about 9-11, I think we all remember exactly where we are. We're on that one. Thank you very much. Next we have Elizabeth. Elizabeth Thomas is a poet and educator who is meant, who believes poetry is meant to be heard out loud and in person. As such, she travels around the country visiting classrooms and organizations for all ages who are interesting, interested in sparking a lifelong love of written and spoken word. She also organizes and helps coach the Kinetic Word National Youth Poetry Slam that represents Connecticut each year since 1998 at Brave New Voices International Youth Poetry Slam and Festival. She has two books of published poetry, her latest through Antrim Press, and recently has written a memoir about caring for both parents during the end of their lives. Elizabeth, thank you very much for coming. Thank everybody for being here. Um, it, it, it actually turned out to be nice enough to have maybe done it on the porch, but <laughs> at least we're all dry. We have dry bottoms in here, so that's a good thing. <laughs> so I wanted to start with, I, I like to start my readings with a poem that changes each time I do it, it is a found poem, meaning I did not write any of these lines. These are lines from students that I've worked with through the years, and uh, each, each school year I, I make some changes to it and update it a little bit. So it's called Poetry Is. Poetry is a feather tickling your brain, or like digging a hole with a toothpick. It's like playing basketball in high-heeled shoes. Poetry is a butterfly's kiss and sounds like the crunch of a potato chip. It is a sign you drive by and then need to turn around to find out what it said. Poetry feels like falling down on gravel or like a shark biting off your finger. It smells like grandma's coffee, first thing in the morning. Poetry is too smoochy for a boy to read. Well, I think it pops like a pink balloon, like boxes beating, blue notes repeating. It is the sharp edge of a knife. It's fun and funny makes my nose runny. It's giggable and jiggable and completely <laughs> wiggable. <laughs> Poetry is so bad, it looks like Donald Trump's hair <laughs> and smells like my dog's breath, even though I love her anyway. Not him, though. Poetry can calm me down when I'm about to hit my little sister. It can break me into a million pieces and then Poetry can put me back together again. Poetry gives me nightmares, yet it also fills my dreams. I love poetry. Yeah. <laughs> What's that? Can, can you be? I think you'll have to talk to Katie over here about that. Can I be after her? Yeah. Maybe. I'll think about it. 
Okay. Oh, there's no open mic? Oh, I'm sorry, there's no open mic. I'm sorry. Right? Is that? We don't have open mic. Yeah, you guys don't have open oh. mic. <laughs> Next time. <laughs> um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay in the classroom for the first uh, uh, couple of poems here. And uh, this is on words and English teachers. Hello. My name is Elizabeth, and I am an addict. I have struggled my entire life, born with this craving passed on to me from both my parents. As an infant, I could not sleep without it. No amount of rocking or binkies or passies helped quell my desire. I needed what I needed, a bedtime story. A bedtime story complete with happy ending, preferably read by my father, since he did better voices than my mom. Dad reveled in his role as primary pusher man until I found a new connection on the playground of first grade. Mrs. Dodge and her wooden leg, a fascination for any six-year-old, the thunk, thunk, of her cane, a curious call to attention. She smelled like chalk dust and chocolate, and on Friday mornings, she'd pick me to read out loud from the red velvet chair at the front of the classroom. I longed to show the pictures to the class and hungered for the smell of each page, but it was the words I craved, how they tumbled, bumped my teeth and tongue, the way they tasted like bubblegum birthday cake exploding in my mouth, pop rocks on acid. There was no kicking this habit. Finally, my own chubby fingers became nimble and learned what it took to spark the page. I wrote my own stories, pages now torn and yellowed, held together with faded orange yarn strung through loose leaf holes, jumbled in a box somewhere in my basement. That was the year our family moved away from the familiar old neighborhood and left everyone behind. Words became my only friends, and I gathered them like some kids collect baseball cards or rocks. I hoarded homonyms and palindromes, tongue twisters and slang. I owned a VIP library card and wrote my first poem that year, feeding an increasing ache. In high school, Mr. Secord believed thoughts and words were often messy. Some of the best ones spilled beyond the margins of the page. And Miss Saul and Mrs. Nicholson encouraged me to find them. Then pregnant at 16, riding became the white horse I couldn't kick. I clung to that tale through years of uncertainty, using poetry to puzzle out questions with no answers. While the rest of my life dissolved around me, I felt complete with a pencil in my hand. These days, I don't even try to hide it. I'm proud to say, hello. My name is Elizabeth, and I am an addict. Hey, kid, you, come here. I've got something. I think you'll like it. <laughs> Thank you. So the next um, few poems were all written individually. Uh, and yet, I think they, they go together pretty well to form a story. So, uh, I'm just going to run through them, one, two, three, four. And the first one is called The Telling. The Telling for my son. Hold on to 16 as long as you can. Changes come around real soon, make us women and men. John Cougar. They're watching a Bonanza rerun on TV. 
My father sprawled on the couch, my mother across her favorite chair, feet dangling like a little girl. I hold tight to the sides of a wooden chair pulled from the kitchen, rocking forward, then back, forward, back. My ears ring like the school bell between classes, and I wonder if I should study for my English exam tomorrow. But the smoke from my father's cigarette pillows my head, and I want to sink, slumber like Sleeping Beauty, believe in happy endings. I'd like a cigarette too, thank you, but the nurse at the clinic says I should quit. My heart feels like a somersault gone bad, and my hands will never be warm again. I feel stupid. When I finally speak, my mother turns toward me and says, what? Wait for the commercial. My chair is straight backed. I slouch and pull in. Nothing to worry about, I say. Placing my hands on my stomach, I gently probe, not feeling anything. School's out. My son weighs heavy in my arms while stadium seats shadow us from above. Rays of sun try to draw us out, but darkness rocks me, smooths my creases. I should be standing with my friends, not trying. I should be standing with my friends, not here in the dust. I should be stepping into the rest of my life, not trying to care for a new one. The names of my classmates are announced, and I watch as they move forward. The noise wakes my son, and he is cranky. I wipe my nose, and we turn to leave. Long and winding road by the beetles, crackles over the speakers. Tribute for Susan Casey. Your office was my safe place when at 16 I pretended not to be pregnant. I too wanted to be a teacher, and you never laughed, never said impossible when that goal melted, moved beyond me. Now everything I do reflects who you were. The kids I write with, their lives wrap me each day with wrinkled paper and tattered bows. In their voices, in their words, I know I make a difference. You created that certainty in me, something to hold on to when my arms were empty. And in my work, I thank you for believing. These words for you from a 16-year-old girl, unsure of everything, except when she knocked, your door would open. Yes. Depth of field, no, one more, <laughs> one more. Depth of field, the portion of a photo that appears sharp in the image. I will place you in a house at a bedroom window looking out. It is dark, but you can smell the autumn leaves riding around you. And even though you ache for more, the crisp edge of season somehow makes you feel you are exactly where you're supposed to be. Stepping from the glass, I'll wrap you warm in a quilted comforter its touch familiar, like the clock ticking down the hallway that leads to your parents' room. You'll lay on your narrow bed, thinking of boys. No one in particular, just a tangle of eyes and tight jeans and lips moving closer. When you wake, the only thing you'll worry about is how you're going to pass Biology 101 and where did that pimple on your forehead come from? Toast and scrambled eggs will be ignored on the kitchen table, and your mother will have packed a lunch 
you'll later trade for bubble gum and cigarettes. And he, he does not belong in this picture. His color off, his posture wrong. So I'll place him on the other side of the bold black lines, and he will wait there until the frame breaks, and beyond the shattered glass, the rest of your life. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I, I had this one memorized, but not, not so much anymore. <laughs> uh, again, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of staying within the classroom. I was trying to think of poems from when I was more your age, Nadia and uh, uh, Winona's age, and so I, was, I kind of pulled out some poems. I don't generally do it at readings, but um, this, this is one that, again, I, I did have memorized, and I'll see how I do. Are you listening? Lately, I listen to the lives of our children, the loners and lost ones, the poets and prophets, the lines that they write with clenched teeth and pens, neon green fingernails chewed raw and gritty, twisted lines traveled like dirt roads and veins. Lately I listen, don't know how they journey past splintering bombs, past standardized tests. Each stutter breath filled with bravado, a bite of cold eggs, an unfulfilled nest. No kisses goodbye, no have a good day. Front doors wide open while back doors slam shut. Classrooms now locked while lives are unhinging. We struggle with freedom. We reap what we've wrought. Through metal detectors past armed guards and profit, they learn locked and loaded behind threatening doors. She is 13 wants someone to love her, but thinks she's too fat, her brace is too bright. Though she's willing to do whatever it takes to look perfect and airbrushed, who cares that it's fake? He is 11, going on ancient, money is tight, father long gone. His face is a mask and he's dying behind it. Alone in the corner, so much can go wrong. What makes you happy? I query these children. They're finally quiet with question mark eyes. I want to help them unclench their fists, right past the pain, rewrite their lives. I ask, what's on your mind? Their faces blank pages like no one but Facebook has asked them this question. This is so hard, says a girl in the back row. And I want to weep, because she's not the exception. I wish to offer them hugs and erasers, pencils and high fives and limitless paper. A safe place for tears, a night sky to write on, their words spilling forth like star shooting dreams, a belief that the future is not what it seems. Thank you. So um, things were a little bit different not so long ago back when I was in high school. Um, seeing you on Facebook, and, and this is sort of like a, 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 a conglomeration, a collective of different poems that all sort of were saying the same thing, and so a lot of different lines came together in, when, I, when I saw somebody in a, in a Facebook photo that I hadn't seen in many years, so um, seeing you on Facebook. 
And I am again 13, in love for the first time, the way love ought to be. All raging hearts and red balloons, forevers and always, practicing our first kiss in the bathroom mirror, awake all night choosing the names of our children. <laughs> Why do birds suddenly appear? <laughs> of course, you had no idea how I felt until I passed you the note at school. The note I poured myself into for weeks. Every time you are near. So much to say, so many revisions, so many exclamation points. I wanted it to be perfection. And it would have been if I hadn't dropped it in the middle of social studies class. We both watch the many multicolored pages flutter slow motion to the classroom floor. I expected crash or thunder, but the only sound was a thwacking of my heart like a clacker on steroids. <laughs> and while your face contorted as if confronting a rabid dog, I wanted to disappear so even Magellan could not find me. And then, Mr. F picked up the pages and read them to the class. His forced falsetto, his foul breath punctuating each line. Pinky extended as if drinking a cup of tea from a china, as if drinking tea from a china cup. Dear Jamie, I love you so much. Each letter O, a tiny heart. I wanted to crawl between the pages of some book on ancient battles fought far, far away. A war where everyone dies. And when the bell finally rang, I was the first one out the door, followed closely by you headed in the opposite direction. Now, all these years later on Facebook, Someone posts a photo from our eighth grade prom. You in your father's too large suit, your arm around somebody else. Your face more baby, your smile more smirk, looking much less handsome than I remember. But if I close my eyes, just like me, they long to be close to you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I don't think he'd appreciate the poem, but that's okay. Um, all right, I've got a few more poems here. Uh, this is called Just Not Fair. Um, <clears throat> My brothers had trucks with sharp edges and removable parts. Trucks that plowed and prodded and crashed into walls. I had a pink Barbie convertible, smaller than my girl-sized fist with wheels that would not spin. They had toy soldiers with binoculars and bayonets, cherry bombs and BB guns. So many toys to poke out their eyes. I had dolls with dainty dresses with lips that puckered. Dolls with names like Betsy, Wetsy, and Skipper. See, Barbara knows she's got yeah. her head over there, right? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, okay. They had erector sets and telescopes, Lincoln logs at mad scientist chemistry labs. I had an easy bake oven complete with plastic meatloaf and flowered apron. <laughs> they wore boots to church. I had to wear feathered hats and patent leather shoes that pinched my toes. All their clothes were black or blue, grass stained and knee torn. My clothes were pink. I didn't even get their hand-me-downs. They had a dog named Killer. I had a hamster named Munchie. They had mini bikes and go-karts. I had training wheels until I was 10. 
They got boxing gloves. I got books. They all slept together in one bedroom on a cool bunk bed and pull out cot. I slept in a crib until I started kindergarten. Their bedroom was right next to mine. And sometimes at night, I'd put a glass up to the wall just so I could hear them burping and farting and beating the crap out of each other. <laughs> and long after they had fallen asleep, I'd still be wide-eyed and wondering. Yeah. OK, thank you. Um, I am my time. Uh, so Katie had asked me to do a poem that uh, Garrison Keillor did uh, on um, Writer's Almanac several years ago. And then my husband uh, posted it back out on Facebook uh, when we had heard that Garrison was not feeling well. I guess he's had some seizures. Uh, so my husband posted it back out on Facebook and Katie asked me to do it. It's called Lies My Mother Told Me. Lies my mother told me. If you keep eating raw spaghetti, you'll get pinworms. And then I'll have to make a necklace of garlic for you to wear each night while you sleep until they go away. If you're mean to your younger brother, I'll know because I have a special eye that spies on you when I'm not there. You cannot hide from it, so don't try. If you touch your down there, anytime other than when using the toilet, your hands will turn green and fall <laughs> off. If you keep crossing your eyes, they'll stay that way until the wind changes direction. It is bad luck to kill a moth because moths are the souls of our ancestors, and it just might be Papa paying a visit. If you kiss a boy on the mouth, your lips will stick together, and he will use the opportunity to suck out your brains. If you ever lie to me, God will know and rat you out. And sometimes, God exaggerates. Trust me, you don't want that to happen. <laughs> Thank you. And um, I've got a couple more. This is, uh, this is called Mother's Work. And uh, it goes out to all the moms out there in the audience, and the dads, and the coaches, and the teachers, and the mentors who care about our children. Mother's work. In Bangladesh, she kneels upon a bamboo mat, old shoe and broomstick nearby the way her mother taught her. A midwife spreads sanctified mustard seeds across the doorstep of this rural birthing room to ward off Zin, the evil spirits lurking. In the Middle East, she lies on the floor, smells incense and straw, drinks water from Mecca. The laughter and assurances of women guide her through each contraction. And in this country, we lie on laundered sheets in brisk hospital rooms. We spread our legs. You can do it. Push. And push we do, ready or not. We swear to Allah, Buddha, Jah, the souls of our ancestors, the great spirit, to God for the safe delivery of our children, head, shoulders, knees, and toes. At the breaking of our water, we will sacrifice whatever it takes. A lamb, a milking cow, a red egg, alms to the poor. My Muslim sisters, Hindu sisters, African Christian questioning sisters, mothers all. 
and this is only the beginning. We'll set aside ego like a tarnished bracelet once thought gold. We want our children to grow up big and strong. Yet each day they walk out our doors, past the old shoe, the mustard seeds, beyond the bloodied lamb, into the arms of a uniform. Patrolling arid borders, dust blown up their noses, dogma down their throats. They do not look both ways before they cross the street into the barrios of South LA, the shadow of suburbia. They accept candy from strangers in schoolyards, walk through the doors of Sandy Hook, Virginia Tech, take the, take the elevator to the top floor of Tower Two, into the mountains of Afghanistan, standing next to a car detonated to destroy with no regard, a plane set to plummet. They board buses in Britain and Jerusalem, explosives strapped to the pregnant belly seated beside them. Mother fucker. Mother nature, mother tongue, a mother's work is never done. Holy Mary, mother of Christ. Now, those were some shoes to fill, yet a mother she was with the same love and ultimately same grief, wanting no less for her son. And until the writing of this poem, I never envisioned my own crowning, a princess after so many boys. Back then, they would not have known to paint my room pink, to buy lace dresses and dolls. They would not have known until after the slap, that first breath of sterile air, congratulations, it's a girl. Lights too bright and focused. No wonder our eyes remain closed. We do not want to witness this uncertain future. We do not want to see our mothers vulnerable, our fathers pacing in smoky waiting rooms, searching for a dime to call home, a prayer to whisper in our ear. Thank you. Thank you. So I, I lied. I actually have one other poem I want to slip in here because my husband came today. And our anniversary, our 19th anniversary was the other day. And so um, uh, I wrote this on an anniversary several years ago. Nine uh, years ago. How many? Nine years ago. Nine years ago. It's called Night Walk, Big Pine Key. We spent uh, some of the year down in the Florida Keys. And uh, so we were there on our anniversary nine years ago. So Night Walk, Big Pine Key. Oblivious. The dog pants hard in heavy air, nose eager for exotic scent left behind by passing storms. While all around us, a show of light and slight of wing, a flash and swoop of dip and dive. The night's so dark we cannot see our hands or feet in front of us, but for the fireflies for flirtatious flight. On line and limb they cling and spring to shirt, hair, and back again. The luminescence of their courtship fills the night surrounding us. Fast flicker in the dark while a chorus of crickets cheer them on. I have no need as I once did to capture them inside a jar. Pretend that I could own a star like cat or dog. Instead, I'd rather take your hand, the one I cannot see, but know is there. Okay, so, so this is like my latest poem and I'd like to end with it. I'd like to thank Katie uh, for inviting me, Rennie for being such a big part of all of this and um, all of you for being here. This is, this is probably, uh, again, other poems have gone into this, and it just keeps on evolving. And uh, you'll, you'll understand why um, when you hear it. Well, I'm just going to start it. OK. I am tired and sick of war. Its glory is all moonshine. 
William Tecumseh Sherman. Mourn your dead land of the free. If you want to see a hero, follow me. Follow me through the streets of Fallujah where forces withdraw while bombs blow at random, where ISIS fighters and suicide martyrs negotiate nothing, where mothers bewildered, arms empty, beseeching, berating the troops, your sons and your daughters. Follow me home to this land of the free where they wait list and forget lies spoken, they forfeit, the truth of this mission, their true north forgotten. Follow me home where soldiers lie dying, while wrapped in old glory, ripped tourniquet pressing on dreams now deferred, despondent, depressing. I am a ribbon, yellow and faded, stuck to this gas tank, and still, I am waiting. Follow me home where troops are neglected. Not only this war, we're all interconnected. And yes, there's the mortgage. Your kids need new shoes and the talking heads tell you this is old news. While proud soldiers wait atop mountains of purple hearts, paperwork spilling, no compass in hand, and our children play war on their handhelds and cell phones. They'll answer the call that duty demands. Follow me where a hero means sacrifice, bravery and valor, not home runs or touchdowns, not shamed politicians, too many to name, yet they'll send our children back into this game. Mourn your dead land of the free, your purple mountains majesty, follow me. When I came home from the Wang Pra Bang, I didn't have a thing where my balls used to hang. But I got a bloody medal and a fine harangue. Now I'm a fucking hero. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. I kept hearing you have to have Elizabeth Thomas read. You have to have her read, and I'm so glad I did. So thank you so much.